Welcome everyone, Dylan Jamelli here today with a brand new video for you and today we are going to talk about how to mix and store your peptides. But before we get into that, I want to thank everybody that's been subscribing and supporting the channel. If you are new here, and even if you're not, if you haven't subscribed, please do if you're enjoying the content. It really helps grow the channel and also, after you subscribe, make sure to click that bell icon right next to the subscribe. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to get any of the updates from YouTube every time that I upload new content. And also, if you're enjoying the content, please click the like button. All of these things, I know they seem minor. I know they seem tedious to some people. It helps grow the channel in a million different ways, and it's just greatly, greatly appreciated. And I will continue to give you all the content that you know what to do with, if you can do me those couple little favors. So let's jump into this video because I know that there's a lot of questions on this and while it may seem basic to some it is not so basic for many of us out there so um, let's talk about storing your peptides so storing your peptides correctly whether they're reconstituted or not is extremely important on how they perform and the quality of the product that you're going to have so um, when you get a peptide, it's going to come in a vial and it's going to have a lyophilized powder. It's kind of crystallized, lyophilized. So typically when it's in lyophilized form or reconstituted form, the rule of thumb is to maintain a temperature between 36 and 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you're using Celsius, that's going to be like 2 degrees to 8 degrees. So make sure that when you're storing them that they're in this kind of temperature. Otherwise, you are going to risk, you know, compromising the compound, etc. And you do not want to do that, especially after you spent good money on these. All right, so let's talk about peptide reconstitution. Proper reconstitution and maintenance of your peptides is imperative. All right, it, it's going to determine how well they work for you and, and if you're going to keep the quality of the product or not. If not stored or reconstituted correctly, you risk damage to or degradation of your peptides. You do not want this to happen. Um, but why do you actually even need to reconstitute these in the first place is the question that a lot of you will ask and I want to make sure that we address that. These substances mainly come in a lyophilized form as I just explained to you. So basically, in simple terms, this means that they have been turned into like a freeze-dried crystalline powder. In order to use your peptides, you're going to have to add fluid to them, and that's where the phrase reconstitution even comes from. So I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. You cannot just add any sort of fluid or water or whatever to these, okay? It, it, it can't be done in a listless manner like this. Great care has to be taken to ensure that your peptide is not damaged during this process. So basically, you're going to have a couple options here. You're going to have either uh, bacteriostatic water or sterile water, which I'm going to get into here in a second. For starters, you're also going to need an alcohol wipe, a syringe, like an insulin syringe, your lyophilized peptide, and then the bacteriostatic water or the sterile water, which we're going to get into like the differences of those here in just a minute. Um, you're going to want to wipe down the top of your vials, all right? You, you always want to be safe and careful and clean, all right? It's a, just a safety precaution. Take your alcohol wipe and do it. I, it. Look, people tend to skip over these things and think it's stupid. And, hey, you might never run into a problem. But then if you run into that one problem that one time, you're going to wish that you had taken those extra couple seconds to do the little tedious things. You're going to want to use your syringe and you're going to either want to pull out either your backwater or your sterile water. I'm just going to say backwater instead of bacteriostatic just so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, from the vial. Keep in mind, you do not want to touch the needle as this is part of the syringe that's already been sterilized. So don't touch the needle with your hands unless you're wearing rubber gloves and even then I don't prefer it. Therefore, touching it would then cause contamination, and we certainly do not want to have any of that going on, especially right now during these times, all right? Um, let's just say that you're pulling out one milliliter, all right? Keep in mind, different doses are going to need different amounts of liquid when reconstituting, and if you're having any trouble uh, with the math on these things, just simply go to Google, type in peptide calculator, and you can convert like this, type it in numbers, etc. It's very simple and easy. Um, so don't let, don't rack your brain over this or make it any harder than it needs to be. All right. Now from here, you're going to want to inject your syringe directly into the lyophilized peptide vial. Do not just shoot the water into the vial. It's going to damage the peptide and render it useless. So don't just pull the water out and then shoot it straight into the syringe. That's not how you want to do this. 
instead of spraying it here, the goal here is to let the liquid drip into the vial slowly. Doing so will begin the process of reconstitution without actually destroying your product. Once you inject either your bacteriostatic water or your sterile water into your peptide vial, you can then remove the syringe from the vial. Some people say you need to lightly swirl around the solution in the vial, but nine times out of ten it's unnecessary and it can actually do more harm than good. You're just going to want to let it dissolve onto its own. Now, let's talk about the bacteriostatic water versus the sterile water because there is a difference there and it's important that you know the difference between the two and, and that you have a good idea on what the differences are. Um, basically, it's up to you on which one that you go with. I'm just going to tell you personal preference. I have always chosen to go with bacteriostatic water. Um, I'm going to just explain to you the differences on the two. I, I don't once I'm the type of guy that if I stick with one and it works well, I just kind of stick with that no matter what. It's like the don't fix what's not broke scenario, although sometimes you can improve upon things. So the difference here first is that bacteriostatic water can be used several times where if you're using sterile water, it's like one and done. You've got a 28 hour span with the bacteriostatic water um, and that makes bacteriostatic water more popular uh, among scientists as well because of the multiple usage that you can get out of it. Now, um, it's considered a non-pyrogenic solution, meaning that it does not conduct heat or fever when it's introduced into the body. It contains about 0.9% benzyl alcohol. Now, this variation of alcohol is what you call aromatic. All right. In terms of chemistry, they are a compound that contains a hydroxyl group that is indirectly bonded to an aromatic compound. So this gives it a pretty pleasant smell. All of this basically comes down to is that the liquid is made in a way where bacteria simply cannot grow. All right. Um, and that's what makes it more user friendly since it can be used multiple times. Now, when it comes to your sterile water, it has its own positive as, uh, as well. It's also non-pyrogenic, but unlike the backwater, it can only be used once. And once opened uh, and used, you would have to actually discard it. Now, in many cases, when the body doesn't uh, fare particularly well with backwater, which is possible, then this is your alternative. Or this could just be your primary. It's completely up to you. It's completely fine to just go with the sterile water the entire time. Um, either way, you're gonna you're gonna be good to go as long as that you're you know cleansing things and keeping things you know clean, etc. So that's how you mix and store peptides. Um, I hate to say the term; it's not rocket science, but a lot of this stuff isn't rocket science. You just gotta learn it once. But you do have to take precautions. You need to follow the way that I said it. It's all a delicate process, and peptides, you know, can be fragile. So just do your due diligence. Pay attention to what you're doing. Don't uh, get lackadaisical in things that you're doing, and you'll be just fine. Just don't overthink it, and just follow the steps that I gave you. So that being said, stay tuned for plenty more to come. Dylan Jamelli, signing off.